Hi there, I'm Ryan Alice, and I'm doing a video project on all that I've learned by 28. Now I'm going to talk about life lessons and the lessons that I've been writing down over the past six years. So going back to 2005, I've had the habit of writing down the things that I learned in my personal journal. And what I've done here for this section is share a few dozen of the key life lessons that I've learned. First lesson I'll share is to listen to that little voice in the back of your head. It's often alerting you to something very important. Another life lesson I learned in 2005 is that you can achieve anything you set your mind to. Back in 2001 when I was 16, I wrote down the very ambitious goal to build a company to a million dollars in sales by the time I turned 21. I missed that goal, but I only missed that goal by 18 days. And there's no way that we would have been able to achieve that eye contact had I not written down that goal and aligned in my life the people, the knowledge, and the resources necessary to figure out how to actually make that a reality. And so in 2005, when we got to $1 million in sales, I really started believing that I could achieve anything I set my mind to as long as I was acting within the golden rule. The next lesson is to never let Non-communication or lack of communication lead to the degeneration of a relationship. Oftentimes growing up, I had the internet as a shield between me and real people. And I wasn't as good as of interacting and communicating with others. And so many times I didn't proactively communicate. And what I've learned is that it is rare that you can actually over communicate. Spend time investing in communicating with your partners, with your friends, and particularly with your teammates. The next lesson is to not avoid doing things just because they may cause conflict. One of the hardest things to learn as a manager is sometimes you just have to get in there and deal with the situation, even if it's going to cause a little bit of challenge along the way. One of the most important lessons I've ever learned is that at the end of the day, integrity is what matters. Integrity is telling the truth and doing what you say you are going to do. Another life lesson I've learned is to never or rarely say but, and instead say yes and. I learned this lesson in 2006 during improv classes in Carborough, North Carolina at the Dirty South Improv Theater. And there we learned to yes and life and to yes and everything our, par our partners there in that act were saying. One of the most important parts of improvisation is to flow with it and to just go with whatever's happening and to yes and what your partner's bringing to the table and accentuate it and elevate it even further. I brought that principle back to my business and I was able to have better debates, better discussions with people by being able to reinforce what they were saying by saying yes and instead of saying but. The next lesson is that there are two ways to determine the rules of life. You can either do it through trial and error or you can talk to smart people. Either way you do it, start learning early. In 2006, um, my company, Verante, which was my web design and search engine optimization company, um, was in a legal struggle with another company down in Texas. And we had a client who wasn't happy with some of the work that we had done. And so I, instead of going and flying out there and talking to her and picking up the phone and talking to the client, um, we talked to our lawyer. And the lawyer said, whatever you do, do not talk to your client. Whatever you do, it will cause a legal issue if you actually have any communications. And so at that time, I was 21 or 22, and I listened to our attorney, and I decided to avoid the client. And the client decided not to pay us for a long time. And now, eventually, we ended up in arbitration, and we actually won uh, the case. But it really wasn't worth it. After all that time, when you look at how much money we made, uh, for the hours we put into it, it really wasn't worth it. And so what I've learned is that if someone sues you or threatens to take you to arbitration, talk to them in person and really figure out how to have a win-win and figure out what the communication gap is. The next lesson is that networking is not about business cards. It's not about exchanging a piece of paper with somebody else. It's about building meaningful relationships that can last for life with quality people and seeing how you can help them. It's not about transactional relationships that are one-off where you can get something in the short term with someone. It's about building something that can last for a long time where you can both help each other out. In 2006, I started learning a lot about economic development, international development, and global poverty. I had one of my most imp uh, inspirational professors as a senior in high school back in 2001 by the name of Mr. Fletcher, who taught economics from a sociological or human perspective instead of the often supply and demand curve mathematical perspective that economics is taught. 
And at the time, he taught that 2.6 billion people live on less than $2 per day. Now, in 2006, the new statistics from the World Bank came out. And it really just hit home that 2.5 billion people at that time, it's still about the same six years later, live on less than $2 per day. Now you might say that $2 in another country goes a lot further than $2 in the United States. And while that's true, this figure is actually what's called purchase power parity or PPP adjusted. And what that means is that the, what it would cost us to buy things like bread and fuel and different things you need to live are actually adjusted based on what it costs there. And so if you can imagine having to get through an entire day on less than $2, that would be very difficult. But the reality is that 39% of the world, or 2.5 billion people, do that every single day. And in fact, 1 billion people live on under $1.25 per day, which is the World Bank's measure for and definition of extreme poverty. A related measure is that 22,000 children under five die every day most of whom die in the developing world from preventable diseases and low nutrition. This simply doesn't have to happen in a world where we have the amount of resources that we have. And so when you think about how much you might make per day, if you're in the working world, or if you're not, think about your parents. In America, the average wage uh, annually is around forty or $45,000. So if you work, say, every day of the year, that would be about $120, $130 per year. Now the reality is, is that the average or the, the mean wage in the world per year is right around $5,000. But if you were to adjust that for all the high income earners at the top, and you were to look at not the mean, but instead the median, the most frequent uh, wage that's around the world, it's actually right around $4 a day. It's about $1,200 per year. Again, purchase power parity adjusted, so it's comparing apples to apples. And so when you think about $10 per day, $10 per day is, is what, about $3,500 or $3,600 per year. And the reality is, is that 80% of humanity lives on less than $3,600 per day. So if you're living on more than $10 per day, count your blessings. One lesson I learned in 2007 is that life is precious. And it can be very, very short. You should always value it. And every day if you can express gratitude and tell those you love that you love them as often as you can. I had a, a friend who experienced a tragic loss in her life at that age and in that year and I learned that lesson very quickly. Another lesson I learned in 07 is that one can see much further by standing on the shoulders of giants. In other words, by being able to have great mentors, you can do so much more and you can see so much further. So really find mentors who are giants and who are high integrity, amazing people. Oftentimes growing up and where, where I grew up, I often didn't really realize how many opportunities there are in the world for great people to do good things. And one of the lessons I learned that year is that the world has so many more opportunities than you might even imagine. So many more scholarship programs, fellowship programs, work programs. If you simply define your purpose and know what you want to achieve, they become much more apparent. And you start surrounding yourself with people who are passionate about the same thing as you. And when that happens, you find out about amazing opportunities and great things. Once you define your purpose, you can more easily seek out these opportunities. I also found that positive developments occur when you associate with these extraordinary people, whether it be networks like I just spoke about, or new opportunities, or really any chance that you have to be able to up your game and do better and to do bigger and to think bigger and to execute at a higher level. Once you find extraordinary people by finding your purpose, great things can happen. Gratitude, as I spoke about in sort of life lessons earlier, it's extraordinarily powerful character attribute. And if you just take time during a daily meditation in the morning or at night and just think, say, what are you grateful for that happened in your life that day? A friend of mine named Kira told me a few weeks ago that one of the things she likes to do with her boyfriend after spending the day apart is to come back and just say three things that they're grateful for about their partner and about what they did that day and how they really came and were present that day. And so gratitude can be extremely, extremely powerful in building a relationship and in achieving internal mastery. One lesson I learned that year is that humans, all of us, often have a deep desire in life for love and affection. Now that's just almost an obvious lesson, but um, that year I separated from uh, a girlfriend of three years and really, really learned that lesson about how much we crave love and affection. 
In terms of uh, communication, I've talked about this before, but if there's one thing in life that you overdo, make it communicating with others, particularly in a work environment or particularly in a relationship, in a loving relationship. Oftentimes growing up in my teenage years and in my early 20s, I would be very serious all the time. And in 2007, I went to a course in Chapel Hill, North Carolina called the Grinnell Leadership Program. And the Grinnell Program gave me a 360 review. And what that meant is we asked all the people who reported to me at work to write up an assessment of myself as a leader and as a manager. And one of the things that really came out is that for a 21 or 22 year old at that time, I was very serious. And I had something called a stone face where I would sort of curl my eyebrows and I wouldn't show a lot of emotion and I would look very serious. And it was my way of trying to act like an adult and trying to be serious and come to the table every day and try to be seen as an older, mature person. What it really did was it, it enabled, it made it very difficult for others to connect to me on an emotional or on a human level. So I still got to have a lot to learn about relaxing, about letting my inner child out, and about silly dancing. And one of the things we've implemented at uh, the new company here, Connect in San Francisco, is after every daily meeting, we take about 30 seconds and we just silly dance. And today we have a team of eight. Someday, hopefully, we'll have a team of 800. And I can't wait till we have our, say, monthly meeting with all 800 and we can end it by a massive silly dance. One of the lessons I've learned about relationships is after seeing a lot of my friends uh, in North Carolina growing up and going through college get married at the age of 21 or 22 or 23, I've found that it's often better, regardless of uh, gender, to wait until you're fully able to stand on your own two feet from a financial standpoint before you choose to get on in a partnership with somebody else. And that's not only important from a financial acumen standpoint, from a financial um, safety standpoint, but it's important from a sense of self-worth standpoint. And when two equal partners can come together, both of whom can live apart if need be, and choose to be together to have two whole selves form a union that is stronger than any one of them individual. It's a much stronger bond than when two people have to be codependent on one another for financial, even covering basic financial needs. One of the things I've learned uh, that's sort of obvious about having children is, if possible, uh, wait to have children and you can really, until you can really financially afford to have children. And oftentimes, um, someone who is in their early 20s might make plenty of money, but many times it's not to your later 20s or after school or even into your early 30s until you really have enough savings in the bank to be able to afford to raise children and to really have great children. And so something for me that I've wanted to do is delay having children until probably earlier, uh, later in life, maybe earlier mid 30s. Something I learned in 2007 when a good friend of mine became very sick is that good health is just everything. And investing in healthy eating, investing in exercise, regardless of your age, is critical to your daily performance. Many people have a sense in their mind that not a lot is possible. And what I've really found is a lot of limitations are self-imposed or they come from friends who are saying, oh, don't be silly, don't even try to be ambitious. Earlier in this project, I talked about aligning yourself with people that enable you to tell you that you can do anything you set your mind to. So whether it's your friends or your own self that's limiting yourself, don't let them. Oftentimes people fear criticism. And what I've found is that one way to avoid criticism is to do nothing in life, to do nothing worthwhile. If you do nothing, the world will leave you alone. If you do something, if you try to put yourself out there, if you try to do something that's a little bit abnormal, oftentimes you will be criticized. And that just comes with the territory of trying to be a leader, trying to be someone that might be in the public eye. And so if you really want to make a huge impact in the world or to live a public life, you have to learn to deal with other people criticizing you. It's one of the hardest things to learn. And when, the first, when that happens for the first time professionally, it can be very challenging to deal with. But getting through that and getting to the other side will enable you to become a much more effective leader and manager. Going into 2008 now, the lessons that I learned that year, one of the first ones is about arrogance. And growing up, I always thought arrogance was just overconfidence. And to me, actually, arrogance is not overconfidence. It's being dismissive of others. I'm a pretty confident person. 
but I hope I don't come across as arrogant. I hope that I come across as valuing everyone, regardless of where they're from, regardless of their background, regardless of, the, regardless of their perspectives, and re recognizing that we all have amazing gifts to give the world, regardless of uh, really anything. And so you can be extremely confident, but as long as you're not dismissive of others, that is okay. Lesson I learned about uh, in 2008 after seeing uh, some of the scandals um, that came out in the political uh, arena that year was to never cheat on your spouse, period. But especially don't cheat on your spouse if you're planning to run for national political office. Now, I'll leave those people to be nameless, but uh, there have been some very high profile cases of people who have ended up ruining their political career by not being faithful to their partner, to their lover, to the person that they've committed to. One of the lessons I learned in 08 was that it takes years, probably 10 years, to become great at something. And so in a 60 or 70 year productive life, you can only really be great at six or seven things. It takes about 10,000 hours to become an expert at something, they say. And that ends up being around 10 years. And so, if particularly if having for every kid you have that six or seven things uh, going down by one, maybe you can do four or five things in life that are that where you can really do them well, where they can really last beyond your own lifetime and leave a legacy. So choose those four or five things carefully. Going into 2009 now, um, I had a, a wonderful um, friend at the time who taught me this life lesson: is that every single day. Do something wonderful with infectious enthusiasm. I've tried to follow that and every single day do something wonderful with infectious enthusiasm and ever since life has been even better. In 2009 I was traveling uh, with a friend Bob and a friend Jess in Uganda and uh, we woke up a little bit late and we had missed our bus from Gulu, Uganda uh, down to Kampala, Uganda. And I woke up and I was fumbling for my alarm clock and spilled milk all over the place and out of my mouth just said, okay, good. And so that became sort of a saying between that small friend group that whenever something was difficult, whenever something was not going your way in life, to just say, okay, good. That happened and that's all right. I'm going to deal with it and I'm going to move on and be able to do something better in this next iteration of time that comes next. In 2009, I had a business partner, Aaron, who was diagnosed with thyroid cancer and learned at that age that cancer really is a horrible thing. Now, in the last section, a couple of sections ago on health and internal mastery, I talked about some of the more common causes of cancer. But regardless of the cause, uh, cancer is a horrible thing. And I'm really hoping that in the years ahead, as scientific research advances into new material sciences and we really learn about the wonders of what's possible with new materials like carbon nanotubes and new drugs and new viral treatments, that we really can, once and for all, end many of the forms, if not all the forms, of cancer. The next lesson I've learned is that we all have challenges in life, some more than others, but we all have challenges. And it's really how you interpret them and respond to them and react to them that counts. Another lesson I learned that year is that generally people act consistently with what is expected of them. That's one of the reasons that prisoner recidivism is so high. If you label someone a prisoner, if you la label someone a mix miscreant or someone who is a, a criminal, they if oftentimes by being punished rather than rehabilitating, rehabilitated, go back into society with that sense that they are still a criminal, they are still a prisoner. If they haven't been fully rehabilitated mentally and, and had their psychology changed such that they recognize that they were someone that committed a crime against society but they are different now and in the future they can choose to live a different life, you often find that recidivism is lower. And so, generally, if you can expect great things from your partner, expect great things of people out there, they will often act consistently with that expectation. One of the lessons I learned in 2009 after seeing some really interesting statistics about happiness in the United States is that most people in this country consider themselves not to be authentically happy. And so if you can find a way to find eternal alignment, to live a life of integrity, to pursue your vision and define your passion, and very specifically figure out what the purpose of life is for you, and truly surround yourself with great people who you love and who care about you, and can reach that level of authentic happiness, you are probably in a, in a rare uh, grouping of people. There is beauty in authentic happiness. 
There's also beauty in seeking to understand detail and nuance. There, the world is simply not black and white. It's not uh, one or the other. It's not binary. There is a lot of gray and there's a lot of detail and nuance that has to be understood, particularly when you start getting into some of the complex systems thinking that's out there in terms of policy and how to make a difference in the world. One of the great travel lessons I've learned in the last few years was in February 2009 in Beijing, China, where I fell for what's called the tea ceremony scam. Two young girls in their early 20s came up to me, and I was pretty skeptical, but they just asked if they could practice their English with me, which I thought was harmless enough. After about 10 or 15 minutes of chatting, and I learned that they were from the western provinces, and they had come to Beijing to learn English before going back, and they were really excited to have uh, someone who spoke English as, their, as his first language to speak with. They asked me after 15 minutes of chatting if I wanted to grab tea with them nearby at a, at a local uh, tea and coffee house, and I said, sure, thinking that that was a pretty safe thing to do. We walked for five minutes, went into the tea shop, sat down, tea came, and had a wonderful time at about 13 different types of tea. And at the end, got the bill, and I hadn't even done the currency calculation conversion in my head, but I, at the time, had a Blackberry and internet access was working, and I did the currency conversion back in the dollars, and it turned out it was $380 for the tea. And we had never even seen a menu with the price on it. And that was a very clear example that it, oftentimes you need to be careful who you trust when you're in a new environment, and to take time and be very aware. The next lesson I learned in 2009 is to not really do too many things that you wouldn't want on the front page of your local newspaper or even the New York Times. In today's age of social media, pretty much anything and everything eventually gets out there into the public eye. So live a, a high integrity life, be honest, and don't do too many things you wouldn't want on the front page of the New York Times. Going into lessons learned in 2010 now, I learned that year to ask for advice more often. I found that oftentimes I tried to do everything myself and wanted to figure out how I could just take on the world. What I realized is that in a company where you've surrounded yourself with great people, not utilizing the strengths and knowledge of those people is really a waste. I also learned in 2010 to travel the world for at least three weeks every year. I find that some of my biggest moments of inspiration, my biggest eureka moments happen when I'm in a new environment. And so whether it's going to Kenya or Uganda or Rwanda or Central or South America, I try to do my best to at least take a few weeks off every year and travel. One of the other lessons I've learned over the last couple of years is that investing in Africa today and many of the countries there is like investing in India 27 years ago in the mid-80s. There are tremendous economic and business opportunities there on that continent, whether it's Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Tanzania, West Africa and uh, Ghana or Nigeria or parts of South Africa or places like Botswana, there are tremendous economic opportunities on that, con on that continent. It's no longer a continent that's seen by many as a place where you can't make a return through investing. And a lot of capital is flowing there now. If you want to invest for the long term, I encourage you taking a look at companies that are growing in Africa today. Today the continent has over a billion people and by 2050 is on track to have about two and a half billion people. A huge market opportunity in which you can do well and do good at the same time. Last lesson I learned in 2010 is that nearly superhuman feats are possible when you're deeply passionate about your mission and you align what you love and with what you do. In 2010, my business partner Aaron and I rearranged some of our company's philanthropic giving and at Eye Contact we created our 4-1's Corporate Social Responsibility Program and we realigned how Eye Contact gave back to the community. And when we did that, I became deeply passionate about Eye Contact at an even greater degree because I knew that every time we grew the company, we had a philanthropic program in place that would scale with that growth. Thanks for watching some of these life lessons learned. I look forward to chatting with you again soon.